Good afternoon. Please allow me to begin my presentation by expressing my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this international forum for the kind invitation, Maraming Salamat, and Mabuhai. It gives me great pleasure to be with all of you today to discuss this worrying enemy in Asia and the rest of the world. I come here as representative of the Council of Asian Liberal and Democrats, CALD, Women's Caucus, and International Network of Liberal Women, INLW. For those of you who may not be aware, CALD is a regional network of liberal and democratic political parties in Asia, while the INLW is an association of women from countries worldwide who support liberal principles. What binds these two organizations I represent is their commitment to liberal principles and values. I am aware that the term liberal has negative connotations in many parts of Asia and in the Philippines. I was informed that the label has been demonized since your presidential elections of 2016. However, the very essence of liberalism actually harks at principles and values that we all hold dear as members of the civilized society. Individual freedom, human rights, tolerance, equality of opportunity, social justice, and the rule of law. Rule of law is defined by the United Nations as a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. The UN elaborates that rule of law requires measures to ensure adherence to the principles of supremacy of the law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, separation of powers, participation in decision-making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrary, uh, arbitrariness and procedural and legal transparency. As a liberal and a practicing lawyer myself, I have always believed that there should be rule of law over rule of men and rule by law. The great British liberal philosopher John Locke once said, whenever law ends, tyranny begins. I could not agree more. For my presentation today, let me tell you about three recent cases from the International Liberal Network where the rule of law has been compromised, and this phenomena of lawfare has become the norm. Of course, we have already heard the unfortunate cases of lawfare in the Philippines and Cambodia in the previous sessions, and how it targets prominent political personalities like Senator Leila, Leila de Lima and Sam Ramsey, among other opposition politicians and activists. In Asia, however, comparable cases can also be seen in countries like Singapore and China. Outside the region, particularly in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia came under the spotlight in recent years because of its treatment of dissidents and human rights activists. By presenting these three cases, my wish is to lend credence to this argument, lawfare is not new. Semi-authoritarian and authoritarian regimes have routinely weaponized the law to silence dissent and maintain their hold to political power. However, in an era marked by democratic decline, rise of populist leaders, and preponderance of disinformation, we can surmise the repressive regimes may be more emboldened to weaponize the law against opponents. Worse, given this prevailing Sage is there's a possibility that even supposedly mature and emerging democracies could be increasingly drawn to the phenomena of lawfare. To prove this point, please allow me to present the recent experiences of Singapore, China, and Saudi Arabia on lawfare. Singapore, 
bankruptcy and captivity in the land of the wealthy. Many of us in Asia look at Singapore as a model for economic development because of its remarkable economic transformation within a short period of time from third world to first, as what the autobiography of Lee Kuan Yew, founding father of former Singaporean Prime Minister, described it. However, it has to be said that this economic development came at a huge cost in terms of repressing political and civil rights. I know this for a fact because an opposition party in Singapore, which belongs to the cult network, the Singapore Democratic Party, SDP, has been routinely subjected into repressive laws. For one, SDP's current Secretary General, Dr. Chi Sun Chuan, has been bankrupted, arrested, imprisoned, and barred from leaving the country numerous times in the past two decades. In 2001, senior leaders Lee Kuan Yew and Go Chok Tong filed defamation charges against Dr. Chi for remarks he allegedly made regarding a loan to Indonesian President Suharto. In February 2006, after Dr. Chi failed to pay Singapore 500,000 in court awarded damages, he was declared bankrupt, which prohibited him from running in the 2006 elections and from leaving the country. For this reason, Dr. Chi, who also served as a cult chairperson in 2008 to 2010, was actually not able to attend any of our network meetings outside of Singapore. He was only released from bankruptcy in 2012 when Lee Kuan Yew and Go Chok Tong accepted his offer of Singapore 30,000 as settlement. Apart from this defamation case, Dr. Chi was also convicted four times for speaking in a public area with audience, numbering to 40 to 50 people, to four to five times about the month of May 2006 elections. In each instance, Dr. Chi encouraged people to purchase copies of the New Democrat, the party's newspaper, as a way of support to his party. The courts convicted Dr. Chi of violating the Public Entertainments and Meetings Act, which provides that any person who provides any public entertainment without a license under this act shall be guilty of an offense and shall be liable to, on conviction to a fine not, exceed, not exceeding Singapore 10,000. Furthermore, the 2009 Public Order Act allows the police to stop protests, even if it is by one individual. Hence, other members of the SDP also have been fined and jailed, many repeatedly for speaking without a permit or for public assembly. And the definition of what is treated as an assembly is extremely broad, and those who fail to obtain the required permits face criminal charges. For example, SDP supporters and activist Jolovan Wam was prosecuted in 2018 for three counts of violating the Public Order Act for organizing two peaceful protests and a candlelight vigil. In the same year, SDP member and performance artist Silan Pillay was convicted of violating the same act by walking from Hong Lim Park to Parliament carrying a piece of art to commemorate the 32-year detention of Chia Tai Po, who was imprisoned under the Internal Security Act. In May 2018, the government charged Jolovan Wam again. This time, it was for scandalizing the judiciary by posting on Facebook that Malaysia's judges are more independent than Singapore's for cases with political implications. Authorities also charged SDP Vice Chairman John Tan with contempt for commenting on his Facebook page that Worm's prosecution only confirms that what Worm said is true. On October 9th, both were found guilty of contempt of court and were asked to pay Singapore 5,000 each. With the passage of the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act in May 2019, Singapore has procured another weapon in its law for, lawfare arsenal. Worried that this law should further silence Oppositionists and activists, SDP recently challenged it in the High Court. Looking at the Singapore experience, it may be good to be reminded of Dr. Chi's words. He said, and I quote, I admit that democracy is not a subject that lends itself to urgent attention in society preoccupied with material riches. 
but I can no longer wait to warn the people of the dangers that lie ahead if society affords not to pay attention. Unfortunately, by the time the situation turns so dire, we may rue the lost opportunity to defend our politi political rights and ourselves. China, using the law against defenders of the law. China is another country which, like Singapore, takes pride in its economic achievements. However, like Singapore, sorry, however, like Singapore, this Chinese model of development also comes at the expense of fundamental freedoms and the rule of law. The rule of law, or lack of it in China, was at the center of the now scraped extradition bill in Hong Kong, which led to months long protests in the city which continue to this day. As you probably know, the bill that would have allowed suspected criminals in Hong Kong to be sent to mainland for trial. It has been widely criticized because of the difficulty of ensuring basic judicial protections in the mainland, which allegedly practices arbitrary detention, forced confessions, one-sided trials, and even torture. With a 99.9% .9 conviction rate of defendants in China, the Hong Kong people who have always treasured the British legacy in its legal system have enough reason to be concerned. In China, officials can easily dictate the entire proceedings. There could be obvious errors and negligence in the case before the verdict was delivered. Hence, there have been cases in the past when people were found innocent years after they were executed. In recent years, lawfare was used primarily to silence human rights lawyers and activists throughout disbarment and imprisonment. Chinese authorities started weaponizing disbarment of human rights lawyers about a decade ago. The technique has te intensified since August 2017, two years after the 709 crackdown in which police rounded up more than 300 human rights lawyers and activists across the country. For this crackdown, nine were convicted of subverting state power, inciting subversion of state power, or picking quarrels and provoking trouble. Three people were given suspended sentences and one exempted from criminal punishment while remaining under surveillance. A number of these lawyers or activists still remain in prison. This strong arm techniques of China, unfortunately, can also be observed in other parts of the world. Saudi Arabia, apostasy and the death of democracy. For one in Saudi Arabia, dissidents, human rights activists, and independent clerics also bear the brunt of lawfare, according to the Human Rights Watch. Last year, the country faced unprecedented international criticism for its human rights record, including the failure to provide full accountability for the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi by Saudi agents in October 2018. Saudi Arabia also opened individual trials of prominent Saudi women before the Riyadh Criminal Court last year and dismissed all allegations that the women faced torture or ill treatment in detention. Most of the women faced charges that were solely related to peaceful human rights work, including promoting women rights and calling for an end to Saudi Arabia's discriminatory male guardianship system. Prosecutors also accused the women of sharing information about women's rights in Saudi Arabia with journalists based in Saudi Arabia, diplomats and international human rights organizations, including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International deeming such contracts a criminal offense. In the International Liberal Network, the most well-known case is that of Raif Badawi, a Saudi Arabian writer and activist and the creator of the website Free Saudi Liberals. The website championed free speech. It was a space where Saudis can openly speak about liberalism in a highly conservative country. Mr. Badawi said that talking about liberalism openly is considered an as apostasy, which is a crime punishable by death. That is why very few Saudis talk about it. He challenged the established rule in Saudi Arabia. He questioned the need of male guardians for women. He asked why all Saudis need to believe in Islam, and he stated that it can't explain everything, and people should be free to believe in whatever they want. For this reason, he was arrested on 2012 on charges of insulting Islam, though electronic channels and several charges, including apostasy. He was sentenced to seven years in prison, and 600 lashes in 2013, but that was changed and increased to 10 years in prison 
and 1,000 lashes in 2014 plus a fine. He remains in prison to this day. These cases of Singapore, China, and Saudi Arabia show that semi-authoritarian and authoritarian regimes appear to be more emboldened to deploy law for lawfare against political dissenters, human rights activists, and democracy advocates. What is more alarming is even relatively advanced democracies, such as the Philippines, as seen most prominently in the case of Senator Lilayla de Lima, are also drawn to the use of lawfare. At a time when we are seeing a global decline of democracy and corresponding, corresponding rise of authoritarianism, illiberalism, and populism, lawfare has become the new normal. For this reason, we as democracy and human rights advocates should be united in our resistance to this worrying state of affairs. Let me end by quoting Senator De Lima. To defend the rule of law is to defend what makes us human beings living in a civilized world. To defend it is to defend our freedom to seek truth, to seek justice, and to seek our own destiny. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jayanathi.